All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Drew Walter. I'm the Pest Management Senior Specialist at the Almond Board of California. I'd like to welcome you all for joining our Trunk and Scaffold Diseases of Almonds in California. To implement the most effective control options, it's critical to understand the diseases that can affect your almonds. During this session, we will look at the epidemiology, prevention, and control options available for the most prevalent diseases in California almonds. First, I'd like to point out that we have the DPR check-in. Most of you guys probably already did the check-in up front, but you can scan this QR code if you need it here. At the end of our session, I'll have a QR code to check out, and it will be available out at outside at the booth as well. Our speaker lineup here, we have live with us Dr. Florin Trias, followed by Dr. Thamus Michaelides, and then we'll have a virtual pre-recorded uh, presentation by Dr. Greg Brown. And first up is Dr. Florin Trias. Thank you, Flo. <clears throat> Th thank you, Drew, and thank you everyone for being here today. So I'm from the Kearney Ag Center, and I work also with UC Davis, and I've been working for several years now investing in canker disease. I think it's good that I come first because I'm going to provide on an overview of some things like Phytophthora and, and, and band canker where Themis and Greg uh, respectively will go into more details. But for a first overview, uh, when we talk about almond canker disease, this is what we are talking about. Wood discoloration, uh, death of the cambium, death of the bark, killing of the bark, usually a lot of gumming on these trees. A v shape or wedge shape discoloration uh, and dieback of the trees. And overall, uh, uh, you know, those canker diseases are certainly one of the leading causes of uh, the tree uh, death in the orchard, especially in young orchards. So we have uh, surveyed California over the years, took hundreds and hundreds of calls from colleagues, PCA and farm advisor, and determined what were those main diseases causing uh, canker in almond. And in order of importance, I will list ceratocystis first, uh, usually associated with, with canker, uh, with shaker injury. Uh, band canker, also quite widespread, Themis will get into more details. Uh, Phytophthora canker, this aerial canker for Phytophthoras, with thin dust being on the, uh, the rise here in California. And finally, if you're up north, Sacramento Valley, you may be dealing with things like Utaipa, the Utaipa canker, the Utaipa dieback, as well as uh, Cytospora cankers. And so when uh, we're trying to develop uh, management strategies, it's very important for us to know the diversity of pathogen that's associated with each of these canker diseases. And so that's a little bit complex if you take a group of pathogens associated with band canker. We're talking about eventually 12 uh, Botrytis variaceae species. Same with Cytospora, several Cytospora species responsible for the canker, and similarly with things like Phy Phytophthora. Uh, several species associated. So it's very important for us as we develop management strategies to really at first know the diversity of pathogens so we can target that diversity while developing management strategies. So I'll start with ceratocystis canker. You have all uh, seen that uh, canker. It's usually associated with the shaker injury. When the shaker is a little too brutal in the trunk, you uh, damage the bark, and that's an infection site for uh, uh, ceratocystis canker. Uh, those wounds are usually known to be um, uh, susceptible for about two weeks. Uh, but what's very unique with ceratocystis canker is this is one of the few fungal canker diseases that's transmitted by uh, an insect. Uh, insect, uh, bark beetle, uh, uh, drosophil, uh, flies, fruit flies. And so that's very uh, in contrast with many other fungal diseases that are rain splashed, or dispersed, or uh, by airborne. Uh, so uh, ceratocystis canker can affect these older trees, younger trees, leading to these uh, sort of dark water-sucked lesions and gumming at the margins of the lesions. Uh, but uh, that's usually where the confusion comes with things like maybe Utaipa or maybe band canker. Ceratocystis canker also prevail at uh, pruning wound infections. And so these are uh, all pruning wounds uh, infection by the ceratocystis canker. If thinning cats also may be uh, impacted sometime, and then in that case, you will have these typical diamond shape uh, pictures and any mechanical injuries on the trees and also, also an entry site for ceratocystis. Ben canker, again, I'll just provide an overview here because Temis will talk into much more detail, but that's how the disease uh, looks like. His name comes from this band of uh, gumming appearing along the trunk circumference. 
And usually that disease um, uh, develop uh, at cracks uh, on the trunk when this vigorous tree grows very quickly in the spring, these uh, cracks may be infection site as well as a pruning wound and that's usually uh, a disease, typically a disease of young trees. Cytospora canker, so if you're in the Sacramento Valley or if you're up north and if you're aware of prune uh, and cherry orchard being in the area, Cytospora canker is definitely a really aggressive canker disease, but mainly so far in prune and cherry, it's definitely a limiting factor almost for, for prune production in California. Very devastating, uh, can kill trees leading to these uh, trees being uh, removed or, or pruned back. And Cytospora can form these fruiting bodies also very easily on this host, which is sort of a way for the fungus to spread around. In Almond, we uh, have found it also in various regions, mainly up the Sacramento Valley. But in that case, those um, cankers are more elongated, less gumming like you've seen before, but elong elongating canker within the scaffold as initiating at a pruning cut. Utaipa, uh, not uncommon, it's only recently really that figure that Utaipa was also prevalent in cankers. In the old days, uh, that wasn't much talked about because it's actually Eventually, uh, something hard to isolate it. The, the, the canker of Utaipa uh, commonly initiate at these cracks uh, on the trunk. You see that right picture, uh, poor scaffold selection with the scaffold allowing for a trunk, a crack at the tree crotch. Uh, that's a typical infection site for Utaipa, but we also can find it here and there at pruning cut as well. I put silver leaf here. Uh, silver leaf is caused by Condrosterium uh, scurpurium. It's more of a wood decay slash canker. But I wanted to highlight it here as we've seen a, a, rise, a rise also of this disease in the past few years, getting into orchards that have up to 20, 30, 40% infection. Uh, the disease can be recognized by those leaves being silvered or silverish compared to a non-infected tree, and this is usually due to a toxin uh, produced by, by the, the fungus. And the pathogen is uh, particularly aggressive. Uh, you can see on these pictures that from a pruning wound, the, the, the pathogen has moved up into the scaffold all the way down into the rootstock just in a matter of a couple uh, months or a growing season. So really aggressive uh, fungal pathogen. So while you are in the field, what are your best way to distinguish uh, from these various pathogens? Diagnostic first, before you even think of your management, of course, the first steps should be uh, appropriate diagnostic of the issues. So Phytophthora cankers, I've illustrated a picture here for a comparison. Really fast growing, a lot of gumming. Phytophthora can colonize a scaffold within a growing season. So really fast growing, abundant gumming throughout the infected area. When you look at uh, ceratocystis, ceratocystis gumming really occur at the margin of the infection. So that's very typical for ceratocystis. You type out less gumming, but typically at the tree crotch, and band canker, a band being formed at cracks on the trunk. So I put another example of what we uh, call commonly a canker. For me, cankers, you've all heard about it because usually it's really flashy, a lot of gumming and this orange uh, pouring uh, uh, sort of sap flows on the trunk. I just mentioned here just um, to um, highlight uh, our understanding lately, we, we have follow up to this foamy canker, but it comes to my understanding that foamy canker is rather a secondary response to the tree to a Phytophthora infection or abiotic disorder rather than being a disease of its own. So I just wanted to highlight it here. And then, you know, as you're in this diagnostic process, I wanted to highlight also that as many other things can cause gumming on the tree. Those are abiotic injuries. Of course, boron toxicity will lead to a lot of gumming, but in that case, you will see that every tree is down the rows are affected. Acid burn, we've seen when acid is poured too close to a big roots that acid can maybe picked up, leading to this sort of straight up canker on the trunk. And finally, herbicide injury. When those young trees, you have freshly removed the cotton and an herbicide is being applied here, particularly glufosinate, we've seen injuries leading to this also typical gumming that, I mean, that could be confused with uh, band canker, for example. So for anyone do, doing molecular diagnostic private lab or any, any uh, uh, public labs, we recently uh, uh, developed specific primers, so that's just a slide for uh, mainly a diagnostic lab where we have now molecular tools that can allow us to just uh, directly sample a wood tissue from a canker 
uh, uh, put that into our PCR machine DNA extraction and get results in about 24 hours. So with molecular tools, uh, that was a great way for us to move from like in about three weeks periods to provide a diagnostic with within 24 hours. So how do these uh, pathogens uh, get in the tree? Well, any canker pathogen uh, needs a wound, require a wound for infections. And so typically these wounds are those large pruning cut made during uh, scaffold selection, primary or secondary scaffold selection. As you see on these uh, pictures, this usually leaves a lot of wounds on the tree. Of course, shaker injury, if uh, the shaker is a little too brutal, you will damage the bark, which is also an entry site, but this is mainly for ceratocystis. And finally, maintenance pruning, but ma really mainly if you do a uh, large cut, if you remove large uh, dead branch and have a, a large wound on the trunk, this also should be considered as an infection site. However, I rarely uh, see any infection coming from the edging. When you edge, I rarely see anything coming from, from those uh, higher uh, branches being edged. So as uh, illustrated in these pictures, I mentioned those uh, four canker. This is what they all have in common, again, is infection at pruning wound. You can see Botrysferia on one side, Ceratocystis, and Utapa, and Cytospora. All uh, may be coming in for primary scaffold or uh, wounds left at primary or secondary scaffold selection. We tell you, your management strategies are going to be uh, focused on protecting these wounds. Here, uh, a slide from Roger Duncan uh, illustrating the different uh, pruning type. Uh, if you're in Australia, you may be uh, avoiding completely you know, pruning. That's usually a general style, non-pruning at all, unpruned. But California usually is between uh, uh, the standard trend prune, three scaffold, or here in the middle, minimal pruning. Uh, and so this is uh, definitely um, one uh, um, a, a rea in the development of the tree where you're going to want to put your efforts to uh, protect these pruning cuts. Uh, this is illustration of a block, a uh, young block uh, that was pruned and unprotected. Every cell is a tree and every red cell is a tree with the canker. So those things can re be really, really damaging to, to the, those young trees uh, if unprotected. So uh, here illustration of typical scaffold selection and pruning. Again, this is going to be uh, the main sort of focus uh, for uh, your, any management strategy for canker disease in the orchard should be done at this stage. Primary, secondary scaffold selection, protect these, uh, these cuts in order to uh, prevent the establishment of these canker pathogens in the early life of the tree. So even though some of these fungi may be slow growing, if you have an infection at this stage, that eventually or most likely will lead to tree death. So again, there's no curative uh, methods to uh, protect, to manage canker disease. So all the efforts have to think, be th think thought ahead of time as prevention they, rather than a curative option. <coughs> so over the years, we run, um, we run uh, many <coughs> fungicide trials. Uh, we tested paste, we tested biocontrol agents. Those are done in the field. We will have uh, pruning cuts made, we will treat with uh, either chemical biocontrol agent or pest and then inoculate with the fungal pathogens to rate the efficacy of the various compounds for pruning and protections. <coughs> Here is the list, I, and I didn't want to get into details and detail, uh, f you know, f five, five, six years of, of several trials and I summarize everything, but we pretty much looked at everything. All uh, classic standards, chemical fungicide registers, uh, we uh, look at premixtures, we looked at biocontrol agents, we look at biofungicide and paste. And here's sort of a good summary here where we have selected some of the, uh, the best products over the years. Uh, in summary, you will notice that acrylic paint or latex paint, what you commonly use, didn't work good at all. So keep in mind that paint are not that great. Uh, but we have a range of really good product. Topsin M, Theophanate Methyl, really provided up to 800% pruning wound protection. We have products like Rime, Quilt Excel, that has sort of a moderate efficacy, meaning they work against some pathogen, but not the broad range of pathogen. But really exciting data from Topsin, and then this Trichoderma product. And I'll get to, uh, into more detail about this, but we have Trichoderma, natural biocontrol agents that work as good as the chemical Theophanate Methyl. So uh, I'll detail a little bit some, uh, um, okay, uh, more information about this trichoderma. Trichoderma are fungi themselves. Uh, they are biocontrol agents and they act by mycoparasiting or antagonist 
uh, within the, the wood. And they're very exciting, uh, actually, by your control throughout the world. Right now, there's a lot of interest for this trichoderma in the grapevine canker world and all sort of pruning wound protection as they, um, they compete pretty much with the pathogeneers. Trichoderma in the pictures against the Utypha lata, they m uh, have the capacity to mycoparasite the pathogens. And the difference between a trichoderma or a chemical is your chemical usually will stay just right at the surface of the pruning cut, not penetrate whereas the trichoderma will colonize the wood and allow for durable protection of a pruning cut. So very interesting products. Uh, be careful when you apply these things. Don't use your standard tanks that has residue of your former blossom spray or something with fungicide residues. So uh, this will affect the, the trichoderma since it's a living biocontrol agent. So have a dedicated system to use the trichoderma to protect and target these pruning cuts. Uh, we uh, here again some data where this uh, Vintech here are now registered in California um, provided as great of a control of topsin. The product worked even better when we had a, a sticker spreader like new film P mix or in the mix. Uh, we have several more work. CDFA is also and CDPR are funding this research to look at the broad diversity of trichoderma. Uh, finally, uh, I'll get into pruning. Uh, one of the questions is how often should I spray uh, once I've made those large wounds? But what we've seen overall in general is pruning cuts are only uh, susceptible for about two weeks. So after two weeks, there is a big drop in susceptibility, which means if you have one-time pruning, uh, I mean protection or spray at pruning, you're good for, for the life of, the, of that pruning wound of the tree. So again, two weeks uh, susceptibility, window susceptibility period for all canker pathogen tested here, the bud, the, the cytospora, the utypa, and others. Uh, when to prune, we looked at several uh, months of pruning between September, October. Of course, well, uh, you want to prune when there is no rain, so it doesn't matter what month you are, but first of all, you want to remember not to prune when there is rain, so avoid any, any rain events. Uh, you know, so period like September, October after harvest may be good, although that these are also period where uh, things can move around with the insects from ceratocystis. Uh, but uh, basically this, I think, my last slide. When to prune, we looked at the susceptibility of all we, of wounds in form of pruning uh, to September, October, November, and December. And what we uh, find out is uh, the pruning cut made late in the season, later in January, their susceptibility then drop to about a week. So what we recommend eventually, if there is no rain in the forecast, to delay pruning where trees are more susceptible, uh, sorry, are less susceptible to infection and, and better prepare also uh, to, uh, to, um, uh, to compete or to, to, um, to prevent the infection naturally as the tree sort of uh, uh, get out of dormancy. Uh, so delay pruning is also definitely uh, more interesting than any earlier pruning like you see September where the susceptibility lasts much longer. But again, remember, do not spray when rain is in the forecast. And I think this is my last slide and I'd like to thank the Almond Board of California and other sponsors like CDFA and more information is available in these publications listed here. Thank you. Thank you, Flo. Next up, we have Dr. Thamus Michalides. And we'll have time for questions after the three presentations. Again, we have one that will be a virtual pre-recorded, and then we'll open the floor for questions. And we have mics up front. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm a plant pathologist uh, at uh, UC Davis, located down at uh, Parlier, at Kearney Agricultural Center. Um, can I have my talk? forward it. So um, today I will cover the uh, uh, subject uh, of uh, managing uh, the band canker of uh, almonds, particularly in the very young orchards. So the uh, contents of my talk will be briefly uh, some symptomato symptomatology uh, of the biology of these uh, fungi that cause band canker, new developments, and that's the most exciting, and the management of the disease. So this uh, disease was described back in, uh, in the 1970s by two prof three professors in uh, UC Davis. It was a curiosity disease, very sporadically uh, uh, found then. And in 2005, uh, 2004 and 5, uh, more of this disease showed up and the, your industry supported uh, a project with us. And we uh, uh, tried to manage the disease. 
And at that time, we could not manage it. Uh, uh, and the conclusion we reached at that time was that this disease has the potential to damage the almond industry, high potential for uh, becoming a very damaging disease. So uh, briefly, as uh, Flo showed you, uh, the name came from the typical uh, symptoms, the band, uh, which can be one band or two bands when it's very severe, and that probably sometimes we see even three bands, and that can be uh, leading to killing the trees. But also the disease can develop in the lower parts of the scaffolds and the major branches, and perhaps in those uh, situations we have uh, uh, infection of uh, pruning wounds. The disease also can be found in the crotch of the trees, uh, particularly when there is a major crack there, which is a wound and is infected by the pathogen that causes band canker. Severe uh, cankers like this uh, will lead to, uh, and depending on the, si the site where the canker will develop, will, uh, will lead to killing of the branch, uh, of major branches, or the entire tree. And you can see from this slide, in this case, does not move into the rootstock and you see all the suckers pushing out. Also, when you have a plenty of inoculum close by, or we have an older orchard, walnut orchards, or riparian trees, you have a lot of inoculum that will lead to infection or pruning wounds, as you can see here. Now, the pathogens initially was described as one pathogen, but now we know that we're dealing with eight different uh, species in the Botryosphereae, and also we isolate Formopsis from these cankers. And you can see seven of these species can occur uh, uh, as well and cause uh, cankers and uh, uh, blights in, uh, in pistachios and walnuts. Uh, these fungi, at least some of these uh, species, can uh, produce two types of spores. They produce uh, uh, pycnidia, where they produce the water splash uh, spores. And in almonds, we also find uh, frequently the uh, pseudothesia that uh, produce the ascospores that have uh, the ability to fly, become airborne, and infect uh, uh, the uh, trees in uh, longer distances. Now, the question was when these uh, fungi infect. We did two years of experiments in which we inoculated uh, potted trees in uh, every month. And you can see from this uh, slide that infections can occur throughout the year. But those infections that occur in, in March to May from these two years results are the ones that develop the, uh, the longer uh, cankers. Remember this uh, date, it's March to May. This is a good indication that if we want to protect these trees from infection of the band canker fungi, this is the time probably to choose and spray. Now, when we started this project, we tried to control this, uh, the trees that had cankers with different methods by pasting fungicides on the cankers to see if we can restrict the canker development or injecting fungicides. None of these methods, or even spraying trees of four or five years uh, old, and uh, uh, we did not have any success to, re to uh, restrict the cankers to develop and not control, in that way we did not control the disease. The only method that we were able to reduce the disease was by changing this irrigation system. And this was a study done in Butte County with uh, the uh, uh, farm advisor emeritus now, uh, Joe Connell, where we, uh, this, the grower used uh, sprinkler irrigations and we installed splitters in uh, some replicated blocks. And uh, the sp sp uh, splitters were uh, installed in 1st of July. In October, we did not see any difference. But in the following year, we saw that the trees that were kept, uh, we kept the trunks dry, they had uh, almost 50% uh, reduced uh, uh, band canker. The incidence was reduced. And that was the only method that we, uh, we showed that we can reduce the incidence of band canker by doing this uh, 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 simple uh, cultural practice. Now, another way to control is to reduce the inoculum. And uh, when you have trees that are dead in the orchard, you have to remove the trees and do not leave the stumps because those stumps, the bark is covered with pycnidia and also pseudothesia that provide the splash, uh, uh, the water splash spores and also airborne spores. 
In 2004 and 5, when we did the studies, we, show, we, we saw, this was from Butte County where we spray fungicides, we did not have any control. But what we learned from this study was that when you have a source of inoculum, and in this case was a severely infected walnuts with Botrysphere, we see a gradient of disease from the distance uh, from the source of inoculum. And this is very clear here in this uh, younger orchard in which we show, we show that uh, the source of inoculum was the riparian uh, trees uh, close to the canal. And you can see the disease was very severe close to the canal, but no disease far away from the ca canal. Now, what happened in the last several years? We see this pattern of disease, the band canker, in very young orchards. And this is a second leaf and a third leaf orchard. So when we saw this uh, uh, type of a, uh, a pattern of uh, uh, disease in the orchards, we raised the question how this uh, can happen. We raised, we raised two hypotheses. Perhaps the trees were infected immediately as they were planted, which is very unlikely, or the trees were delivered to the, uh, the, the grower and the grower planted and uh, the disease developed from infections that we couldn't see, the latent infections. The first hypothesis was rejected because we couldn't find any uh, obvious uh, uh, source of inoculum or even if inoculum was around the orchard, you could have seen a gradient from the borders of the orchard to the center. We haven't seen that. So we then emphasize to show if the second hypothesis was right. So we develop, a, uh, we needed a technique and we developed this technique to see if we can detect these uh, pathogens in symptomless trees. The technique is a quantitative PCR. It's a method that quantifies the DNA of this fungi. In this case, we had specific primers for six uh, 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 canker pathogens. And this technique now is routinely used in, in our laboratory. So what we did, we uh, uh, collected newly emerged shoots with no symptoms, of course, and one year, uh, uh, all shoots with no symptoms. And then by taking the bark of this uh, and analyzing with the qPCR, we found three major pathogens here, canker pathogens, the Botrysphere dothelia, the Lassio diploria, and Neophysicocum. Notice here that the red bars are very high. This is the Lassio diploria, which is, we know from other experiments is very aggressive. And it occurs in latent infections in much higher incidence than the other canker pathogens. Now then, we took young trees from a nursery, and indeed, again, we found the same type of canker uh, pathogens, and again, the Lysio diploidia was uh, uh, very higher than the others. And you can see, regardless of the variety, we have these latent infections in all these varieties. We repeated this with other nurseries. This is from one nursery, but other nurses showed similar results. We thought then, if we take these trees which do not show any symptoms, and we spray them in the spring, uh, we spray the trunks and the lower uh, branches uh, in March, early March, what will happen? Will it be possible to uh, uh, reduce the disease? Here are the results. Eight months later, the untreated control these are three replications of 50 trees each in the field, commercial field. And we use topsin in this at the uh, rate of the label. And in each replication, 50 trees, you can see that uh, the untreated control was really high in the canker incidence. And the treated uh, um, trees uh, the, with topsin or with topsin plus rally uh, show much le uh, less uh, incidence of disease, very significantly less. Now we went back. Remember, we just put one spray in 2019. We went back in 2020, 16 months later. You can see the control, the anterior control was a little increased, the incidence, but the treated trees show a little higher levels of uh, incidence, but still significantly lower from the untreated control. 33 months later, remember again that there was one spray in 2019 
And in this, we see that the untreated control has severe, uh, some of the trees are very severely infected, ready to be removed by the grower, but the treated uh, uh, trees do not have any severe orchard, uh, uh, severe um, uh, bunt cankers, and none of these trees will be removed. So the other thing that we wanted to see, if we have a young orchard and we see some symptoms, if we spray a fungicide, is that uh, going to be effective? So we did this treatment, we sprayed in October uh, 2020, and then another treatment sprayed in, in the March 21, and then we spray uh, both in October 2020 and, 20, uh, and in the March 2021, and then uh, we have a treatment with two sprays in, in, uh, um, two sprays in March and April. You can see here the anterior control, which is represent the, uh, the, the blue bar. Uh, actually, this is the, treatise, the trees that we recorded at the time before the treatment. You can see very high levels of um, uh, band canker. Um, you see some variability al along in, the, in the orchard, but you can see the sprays, regardless if it was one spray in the fall or one spray in the spring or two sprays in the spring, reduced the disease significantly, but there were no differences among those sprays, which tell us that the spray, in, when the, the cankers are very young, will be effective in reducing the incidence of the band canker. So to summarize here, uh, I think this is a very exciting news because it introduces a new cultural uh, a, a management of the disease, uh, um, a, a new a practical um, approach to controlling a disease before we see any symptoms. So uh, to use this, uh, for instance, in this case, Topsin M as a preventative uh, approach to reduce the cancer in very young orchards. So to summarize here, um, first of all, you have to obtain clean trees from nurseries. Spray the trunks. If we don't, if you don't see any disease, but you need to spray. Uh, you need to spray when the trees are first, second, third leaf, and with topsin, and to get the trees out of the window of susceptibility by the band canker. Uh, keep the trunks uh, of these trees, the young trees, very dry, and protect the pruning wounds again with uh, topsin M. Uh, and uh, at the label rate, and when uh, uh, Flo introduces the trichoderma commercially, uh, perhaps that will be a treatment for the pruning roots. But now, when you have the bank canker present, in, again, in very young orchards, keep the trunks of those trees dry. That's very important. Spray the, spray the trunk, the trunk and the scaffolds in, in, in October, in the fall, or in the spring, uh, with one spray of topsin, and uh, to, uh, protect, uh, to protect them and uh, prevent the development of additional canker. Protect the pruning wounds, again, the same technique as the uh, previous uh, category, uh, with, again, with topsin. And to remove uh, the kill trees. Uh, in case you have uh, kill trees, remove them, because uh, these fungi produce pycnidia very soon, and then you introduce a second source of inoculum in the orchard, which is um, the external inoculum, as I call it, the pycnidia and the pseudothesia that produce the spores to spread around. The latent uh, infections are the internal inoculum, inoculum that is in the tree bark before you see any symptoms. And also you keep uh, 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 wood piles away from the orchard because of these wood piles, again, will have pycnidia and pseudothesia of the fungus that can uh, contribute to additional infections of the pruning wounds. Remember, we don't see the symptoms of Bochersperiaceae fungi initially, and people call them endophytes. We call them latent infections. It's a, a, a sleeping giant in the orchards, the almond orchards, the young almond orchards, in pistachio orchards, and walnuts. And thank you.
All right, and next we have the recorded presentation by Dr. Greg Brown. Hi, uh, this is Greg Brown. I'm sorry I'm not able to be with you this morning. Uh, my, my employer's COVID-19 policies aren't allowing me to be with you, uh, but I will present you this uh, information on almond trunk and scaffold diseases caused by Phytophthora, uh, current status in management options in California. I'd like to acknowledge my team collaborators, Jamie Ott, Mohammed Yagmar, Jim Adescavich, and UC Cooperative Extension Farm Advisors statewide. Okay, problem one in, in this session is going to be what we refer to as perennial Phytophthora canker. It's, a, it's really a cyan disease of almond orchards and it mostly um, results from just one species of Phytophthora, Phytophthora citricola. Uh, it's actually a complex of some related species. It's most prevalent in mature orchards. And then problem two is going to be Phytophthora root and crown rot, which can also lead to trunk cankers, as you see here. Um, it's especially a problem in young orchards presently in California. Okay, um, there seem to be some, some trends and factors impacting Phytophthora diseases on almond in California. Uh, as we've shifted from Nemegard rootstock to Hansen 536, especially in the parts of the San Joaquin Valley, um, we've seen more trouble with Phytophthora. It's relatively susceptible. Um, we apparently have some continuing infestation issues of some nursery stock with Phytophthora. There's been a shift in and movement of California pop populations of Phytophthora. Um, as we've evolved our, our planting systems, um, we've had issues with suboptimal drip line placement. Um, we get ourselves boxed into needing to irrigate right on the root crown sometimes with our planting schedules, and that can be bad. Um, we've, we've got some tree training system issues that seem to aggravate the perennial Phytophthora canker problem, the cyan disease problem. Uh, we've had introductions of Phytophthora from orchard soils from surface water in some cases, surface sources of irrigation water. And uh, also in, in recent years, we've had several bouts of some rather severe spring storms that seem to be conducive to these cyan infections by Phytophthora. Okay. Before we launch into those two problems, the cyan canker disease and the root and crown rot, um, just some, a few reflections here. Phytophthora truly is a water mold at uh, multiple scales. At the macro scale, um, it, we, we find that it does infest surface sources of irrigation water, so it can get around the state and within regions in this way, spreading in water. And then uh, more on a micro scale, um, it's well adapted to being spread by water within the orchard and reaching the roots through water. Between periods of soil water saturation, it can survive as thick walled spores, such as you see here on the left, um, can survive drying, even relatively warm temperatures. Uh, but when we have episodes of soil water saturation, uh, it can rapidly produce sporangia, which release these swimming zoospores. And they're really the agents, these swimming zoospores are really the agents that really build up phytophthora problems rapidly. Um, when we do have soil water saturation around the root crown, these spores can swim. They're able to make it through 
the torturous path of soil particles and actually reach the roots and infect them. Then another reflection on uh, Phytophthora diseases just in general. Um, it's really pretty important to diagnose a Phytophthora disease correctly. There are several other disease problems that can mimic Phytophthora infections. You'll, you'll hear about some of them in this session today. Uh, and there are also some diagnostic tests that aren't really good at at um, specifically identifying a Phytophthora problem. I would say that ELISA-based tests, which are immunological tests, aren't really sufficient in their specificity to properly identify a Phytophthora problem. Um, we can culture Phytophthora from infected tissue, as shown in the top left. Uh, we can bait it from soil. We really like to get it from the tissue and we're sure that it's actually causing disease. <clears throat> and then the best, most specific identification of Phytophthora species is uh, from DNA, uh, the, the nucleic acid of these organisms. And we can get a very good sensitive ID. And there are currently even uh, DNA-based tests from tissue that can specifically identify Phytophthora. So if you, if you have a uh, DNA-based uh, or an isolation-based followed by some DNA sequencing uh, identification, that is a very good thing. But I would say that you also want to see the symptoms that Phytophthora causes in the orchard. I should say good thing in, in um, having confidence in your diagnosis, not in having it in your orchard. Okay, so... Um, where are we with these types of problems, the root and crown rot and the uh, cyan diseases? Um, this is just a diagnostic perspective on that question. Um, with root and crown rots, um, what the diagnoses tend to show us is that we're having a lot of trouble with our young orchards, these, this top tier here, uh, say up through about our fourth leaf. And there's quite a variety of Phytophthora species that are infecting young orchards, um, also many counties. Uh, this is just a very brief snapshot. Um, we've, I would say our um, incidences of test results have about doubled since I made this, um, summer, this summary table uh, about a year ago. Um, but all these orchards were affected by crown rot, as you see. And hybrids were prominent in the um, uh, rootstocks affected. But as we move into mature orchards, uh, bearing orchards greater than fifth leaf, um, <clears throat> our Phytophthora problems are predominantly associated, at least in our samples, with the Phytophthora cystricola complex, which includes this acerina, uh, and then also some infection by Phytophthora cactorum. Um, and I'll talk to you about this problem after the root and crown rot, or sorry, before. So here we go with the first problem, this perennial Phytophthora canker uh, that infects cyan's. Um, this was initially discovered down in Kern County in the late 90s. Um, we've seen uh, several episodes of it after that in Kern County and uh, also episodes farther north in the San Joaquin Valley. And Brent, Reholt, Brent Holtz has reported to me seeing this problem in um, San Joaquin County uh, at, the, at the north end of the San Joaquin Valley uh, recently. It can be quite devastating as these Im images suggest, um, but it's, fortunately it's not, uh, not real common. Um, what do we know about the biology of this disease? Uh, we don't know exactly where the uh, primary inoculum comes from. Somehow it gets into the soil, um, either from water or historical uh, residue, but it's there. We determined by uh, sampling uh, harvest debris as it got deposited in almond trees that this debris, in fact, contains viable inoculum of Phytophthora. 
So it's a very dry, hot uh, period when it gets up on the trees, but it can hang out there. And uh, it seems to be that when we get wet, rainy periods um, that are cool enough to facilitate infection, uh, this debris, which finds its way down into these, what we call water pockets, then infects. And you see a, an infection started here. It looks like some water has collected at some point. And the end result of this disease is almost invariably that the tree dies with a Phytophthora infection. Uh, a little more on these water pockets. Um, there are several aspects of them that are particularly vulnerable to infection. Um, as I mentioned, they're a zone where you can get accumulation of debris that can wash down or blow down. Uh, you find grass, almond seedlings, uh, growing in the residue that accumulates in the pockets. Um, they can accumulate water. And as I brought out earlier, water is the key to production of the infective zoospore inoculum. And then when we get bark inclusions where the scaffolds push against one another, they can, they can induce a crack or at least a, a, enough of an injury in the bark to let Phytophthora in uh, that injury. And that's typically where these cankers start, is right in that uh, crotch pocket or, or water pocket, we call it. Okay, that's what uh, most of the infections uh, where they tend to start, but we also can get um, these perennial Phytophthora cankers originating from the soil less frequently, usually, but uh, if we have Phytophthora cap Forum in the soil, we can find this problem occurring where the infection occurs at the soil and moves up the tree. Um, just to show that this can vary by orchard where you get the infection above ground, as shown at the right, top right here, or below ground, shown in the rootstock at the lower right. These are just three orchards that we surveyed in Kern County. Uh, this was quite some time ago, but it's documented if you want to look at that, the details of that story. You see where we had um, uh, Phytophthora citricola in the first two orchards, um, it was predominantly above ground infections. Orchard three, which predominantly had uh, Phytophthora cactorum present, we got these soil borne infections. You might ask, uh, do we know precisely when the infections are occurring? Uh, we tried to get at this question, by inoculating trees at various intervals through a couple of years. Um, and we'd inoculated a date, allow the canker three weeks to expand and measure canker development after that period. And you can see that um, canker development didn't occur very fast during winter, or very cool months. But as we got into the spring and summer, most of the time, cankers expanded rapidly within a three-week period. These are air temperatures shown in the bottom graph um, in Kern County. And another indication here is that in the summer, sometimes probably we're getting up into temperatures that are lethal or near lethal, at least to Phytophthora citricola. But the point is that most of the periods in the spring and late summer even, um, these pathogens can expand can invade the tissue and proliferate. So a uh, pretty bleak picture for, you know, using weather as a, uh, you know, tr try to identify a sensitive period. Basically, the trees are sensitive all of the year. Even in the winter months, um, we followed some of those uh, cankers that didn't show much development in the winter months initially after inoculation. Um, if we came back several months later, they had all expanded significantly. So even if the cankers take a while to get going, they can, they can continue to grow until the tree is girdled. All right, so um, really what we, as far as cultural approaches for management of this problem, we think that the key, the key aspects are number one, avoid Phytophthora susceptible rootstocks, and I did talk about rootstocks a bit yesterday. 
Um, also, don't bury your graft union. If you bury the almond cyan uh, tissue in soil, um, you're increasing the susceptibility of that whole tree to cyan invasion. Um, I mentioned avoiding water pocket bowls, but the way to do that effectively is to train your scaffold so that you don't end up with junctures like shown at the right here where all the scaffolds are originating from basically one height on the trunk. You can try to spread your, your scaffold uh, points of origin vertically along the trunk when you train the trees. And then also when you, when you do that training, you want to avoid scaffolds that have bark inclusions which are subject to cracking and also are, are weak uh, anyway. All right, and then another um, approach that we, we tested long ago, uh, but it's, it still seems to work, it gives some help in these problems, is to use phosphite treatments. Uh, we, we did quite a bit of testing uh, back in the early 2000s uh, with phosphite treatments. We found that the most effective was a foliar spray as opposed to a chemigation treatment. And um, we, we determined that say one spray, for example, in very early fall or late summer could give us uh, many months of protection. Um, one spray in November here in this particular experiment allowed us to suppress canker development for, I think it was almost four months if you do the math here. Um, these treatments uh, are best applied preventatively. So if you see the start of a uh, perennial phytophthora canker problem, you probably want to really seriously consider a summer fall foliar spray program with phosphite. You do need to be aware of industry limitations on phosphite residues. European Union has paid quite a bit of attention to that issue in the past and things could change. Um, also, I'd like to mention that uh, Jim Adiscavich uh, is leading a team of us testing new fungicides that we hope ultimately, given testing, that we may be able to use also for the cyan canker problem. But right now, the uh, target is on crown rot. Okay, so problem two, Phytophthora root crown and trunk rot, resulting mostly from rootstock infections. As I said, uh, young orchards are very sensitive to this problem. Um, the risk factors seem to be uh, Phytophthora infested nursery stock or orchard soil. Either one or both can set you up for problems, especially if you compound it with lots of soil water saturation around the root crown um, and if you have a susceptible rootstock. I have uh, pointed out the diversity of phytophthoras that we're up against here, but the fact that they're all invading through the root crown, so the rootstock can be a key factor in avoiding these problems in addition to the cultural management. A little more in the cultural management and the importance of treating phytophthora as a water mold. In this image on the left, you see a canker started down here uh, if we expose that situation a little more, um, you see the drip line here. There's an emitter close by. And for example, it appears on this particular tree anyway, that the root was infected and the phytophthora has moved up this root and into the crown. So th just this, this zone around the root crown can be very critical and uh, moving your, your drip lines out as quickly as you can from the trees, I think can give you a, <clears throat> a lot of help. If you don't have Phytophthora on your trees or in your soil, um, you may get away with cloaked drip line placement on your rows for a long time. But if you do have Phytophthora there, it's, it can really be trouble. Okay. Uh, Genetic resistance in Phytophthora crown and root rot. <clears throat> We're doing a lot of testing at Kearney Ag Center now, uh, evaluating new rootstocks for resistance to Phytophthora. 
And uh, other team me members are looking at resistance to crown gall and plant parasitic nematodes. Um, here's uh, just to show you some hopeful results. We have found in these tests, even within the peach almond hybrids, which we've thought to be fairly sensitive to Phytophthora, we see quite a bit of variation in their susceptibility to, uh, in this case, our, uh, we're evaluating with a mixture of Phytophthora niederhauseri and Phytophthora cactorum, which are two of our most important crown pathogens. So these are all standard rootstocks available. And then um, in the same experiment, we also are, are testing a bunch of experimental rootstocks. And the goal here is that we're trying to identify rootstocks that not only have resistance to Phytophthora, but also uh, in collaboration with colleagues, Andreas Westfall and Dan Kluffel, um, we're, we're hoping to identify rootstocks that have resistance resistance to crown gall and nematodes as well. And then uh, chemical management of Phytophthora crown and root rots. Um, we, we do have uh, the phosphites and methanoxam that are registered currently. I mentioned uh, pretty good results with phosphites for the cyan cankers, but I would also say that it, that, that effect can extend down to uh, tree trunks. We did test uh, with inoculations of trunks and demonstrated efficacy of phosphites. Um, but then at this point, we have some new oomycete fungicides coming along. And uh, Jim Aniscavich is, is leading this effort on fungicide testing. Uh, we're real pleased now that this uh, Arondis formulation uh, is like it appears to be available as of January 2022 for soil application only. Uh, Jim emphasizes that it you really have to pay attention to the application methods. Applying it to dry soil may not result in efficacy. Applying it properly according to the label uh, to moist soil uh, has given Jim very good efficacy in his test. Okay, so some closing comments. Uh, best management of both this perennial Phytophthora canker complex and Phytophthora crown and root rots involves integrated cultural, genetic, and chemical control approaches. Uh, rootstock and fungicide testing can be helped by involvement of UC cooperative extension in diagnosis of phytophthora problems. Uh, we, we can work closely with them and I keep our, uh, our, uh, our eyes on the uh, phytophthora populations that are causing the problems and therefore ensure that we come up with rootstocks that are resistant and fungicides that manage, them, manage the phytophthora populations. Okay, I thank you for your attention with this um, recorded presentation and invite you to email me any questions that you may have. Thank you. All right, uh, definitely thank you to Dr. Brown for recording that. At this point, I'd like to open it up for questions. If you have any for uh, Dr. Thamus or Dr. Um, Miglides or Flotrius, go ahead and come up to the podium or raise your hand over here. The sprays were done in early March. Early March. Early, early March. Yeah. Question in the back here, it's all first. That's you, with the hat. Well, basically the more you wait before protecting your wound, the more risk you take, right? So our recommendation is to come right after pruning or while those guys are pruning, follow the crews and, and protect your, your pruning wound right away. Now we got another question back here. Yep. Yeah. 
that's actually a, a good question because um, it's actually um, in a discussion right now. Uh, it may not be that critical to almond because it's a matter of how much fruiting bodies are, um, are uh, present on this uh, dead wood. But recent work from um, Mohamed Nouri, a, a farm advisor in uh, San Joaquin County, who worked both in cherry and walnut, where a lot of this wood has usually a lot of fruiting bodies, what he has shown is that shredding is another factor for spore release. So that's something new in our knowledge. We didn't know that you know ju just shredding itself in the absence of water, in the absence of rain, could be a factor for spore release. But so new data are coming up that sh showing that that shredding is is um, a factor for spore release. But uh, the thing with almond is the question how much fruiting bodies is present on this wood. It's possible that you may be finding some Botryosphaeria, but it's unlikely that you'll be finding Cytophora, Eudipa, and the others. And Themis may comment about that as well. But uh, it, it may be less of a risk factor with almond, but nevertheless, uh, this hasn't been studied in almond. We've studied it in walnut and cherry shredding release spores, so uh, keep in mind. For almond, uh, the young tissues, uh they do not uh, produce, uh, um, they do not support uh, pycnidia formation uh, for Botrysphere. The pycnidia will be mainly in the trunk and the scaffolds. So if you shred those big pieces, then there is a chance that you have surviving inoculum. In other experiments, we shredded the material that had pycnidia and depends on the host. In walnuts, for instance, uh, we had a reduction of 66% after six months. And in, uh, in other cases, uh, uh, like uh, Bojostria and Pistachio with brand holds, one and a half years, uh, uh, we ev even bury the, the shoots uh, and uh, the Pycnidia still have surviving spores. So some of these fungi survive for a long time. question up front here, right? Oh, Brent, you want to chime in? Um, is this on? Um, I, I've had this discussion, you know, hundreds of times with growers. Um, you know, when, when we're selecting our scaffolds for the first time after, you know, after a, one year in the orchard, you know, it's the, it's the, probably the most critical pruning those trees will ever have, the biggest wounds that those trees will ever be made. So it seems like after listening to this discussion and talking to you guys before, but I, it seems like the, the overall recommendation should probably be to treat those, those huge, big pruning wounds that, that first year after scaffold selection. Is that, is that, that's that's, true. Is that our take home yeah. message? Yeah. I think that was the common theme throughout yeah. all the yeah. presentations, yeah. In the experiments we have done, you know, we treat actually uh, uh, the, uh, the pruning wounds, and then we inoculate. Uh, it's a one day difference. So, and then we show reduction of the infection. So, I think it's, that's a good practice to protect those wounds, especially when you have source of inoculum available. But now we find in prunes for other another fungus, the cytospora, this latent infections. Once you create a wound and you cover this wound. Infections can develop from the latent infections, the internal inoculum mm -hmm. of this fungi. But back, back to uh, Brent's comment, I think it's a good summary. That if, if you're going to make any efforts of uh, protecting uh, your trees, this stage of uh, early and, and primary and secondary scaffold selection is going to be the phase where most large pruning cuts are going to be made. So you don't want to miss protecting uh, those wounds. But what, what I would like to emphasize though, you know, these experiments which were done in the field, you notice that did not show any symptoms. And we spray uh, toxin before we seen any symptoms and we prevented the kinds to develop. That's a new management approach of the young orchards. When you establish a young orchard, you don't have to wait to see the disease in order to concern about controlling it. You have to put this uh, sprays in advance, and then you protect that period of time when the young trees are susceptible. Up front here.
I will let Flo uh, respond mm -hmm. to that because he did some uh, pruning, serial uh, pruning experiments. Yeah, so I had a slide on this, but it, uh, I would say it, it, it is a complex matter in a way that we have a broad spectrum of fungal pathogens. So most importantly, uh, most of these fungi are spread during a rain event, right? So you may say I'm coming in after a harvest when you know you probably have another four, five weeks, six weeks, eight weeks of dry weather. So that may tell you it's a, it's a good time because there won't be rain, no, no fungal spore splashing. However, this is a time where the um, vector for ceratocystis canker, which is in that case an insect, are still very active. Add grower pruning early in the season, like um, in, in early November, and they were hammered and the pruning cuts by ceratocystis canker. In that case, the, the, the vector, the insect, is active. So overall, we looked at the susceptibility of this pruning cut uh, by inoculating the wounds ourselves. What these data are showing is for all these pathogens, the susceptibility is less when the pruning is delayed up to January. But in the same time in January, you may have more risk for rain, so you want to avoid that rainy period. But nevertheless, the susceptibility in January has dropped in some northern uh, Colusa area where we had the trials down to a week, whereas the period, the susceptibility, the window of susceptibility in October, November was up to three or four weeks. So that window in January was less susceptible. But again, remember, most importantly, you don't want to rain in the forecast. Great. Thank you both. And with that, we're already past our time by one minute. We could take one more question if you want, but I know some of you probably have other sessions you'd like to join. So. So the question was, is uh, trichoderma has been approved or registered to California? So yes, the, registra the, the, the um, registration is of officially, uh, um, uh, it's officially approved, it's registered. I think the only issue of the, 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 the chemical company, which is AMVAC for the Vintech product, is uh, the, 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 the supply chain issues where the, the, you know, there's issue of bringing the product from Europe at the time, but it, the product is originally being produced in Europe. But AMVAC, uh, uh, side of the, uh, yeah, is, is, um, is in charge of um, this product, is, uh, this, this distributing this product in California. Yep. Okay, thank you everybody for joining, and anyone that's doing the DPR checkout, go ahead and scan there, or you can scan outside. Thank you all.